Okay, great. Um, my name is Nishi, and you all know Justin Esby. He's very famous. Um, so we're going to talk uh, about SIG AWS um, and give you a status update. I'm going to run very quickly through it because we have a couple of demos, and we're hoping that we can run through them fast. So as a summary, uh, we did update the SIG AWS charter. Uh, the link is available there. You can go and see our charter. Um, as a summary, um, what we want to do in the SIG is make sure that we are doing maintaining all the interfaces, libraries, and tools that are necessary to integrate Kubernetes tightly with AWS services. Uh, we've also worked on enabling Prow, which is a CI tool for Kubernetes upstream, and get it integrated with uh, both COPS, some of the work that Justin did, and on EKS data plane. Um, it's actually providing CI signal for most of the SIG AWS sub-projects right now. Um, in the future, we want to work on scale testing, and there is a perf dashboard where a lot of numbers for GCE and GKE are published today for Kubernetes. We want to expand that to AWS. Um, SIG AWS will continue to be a user group uh, where we will provide support for issues and feature requests on an ongoing basis. And there's more support from Amazon now, so hopefully the pace at which we are resolving issues for our users goes up. Um, and also documentation. Um, so right now, we actually host five sub-projects. We will talk through each of those sub-projects today as fast as possible. Uh, we have also formalized CAPS now. Previously, we did not have any CAPS. And for all of these five sub-projects now, we have CAPS. Um, and for every new sub-projects that would, we would create, we want to have the process of actually providing these CAPS and making sure they're well main maintained. Um, Chairs, you already know Justin SB. I just joined two quarters back, and of course, there's Chris Nova. She'll be joining us towards the end of the talk. So quickly, uh, this uh, version 1.13 release was exciting for us. We launched three out of three features. So let's go through each of those features, and I'll show you some demos on it as well. Um, so we released the AWS ALB ingress controller. I'll talk to you very quickly about what ingress actually means. Um, sometimes there are so many API objects in Kubernetes, it confuses me. So it helps to actually talk about the concept. Uh, we did an alpha release for the ingress controller. Um, we, the initial design was uh, provided to us by CodeOS, but we had to refactor a ton of the code. Um, we d did some optimizations like using the controller runtime library, which is provided by the SIG API machinery, and also adding some AWS SDK level caching that allows the code to be more optimized. We added support for uh, not just node port, which is also called traffic mode type instance, uh, but uh, pod IP. What that means is you can route the ALB traffic directly to the pod if uh, the cluster has support for CNI Kubernetes. Um, so I'll talk through that in more detail, but uh, that's one of the features that we stabilized. Uh, we've added CI signal, and I'll show you the, uh, actually, I can go click. It does make me a little proud. Previously, we didn't have a SIG AWS bubble. Uh, we were resting under SIG Google or Google because uh, there was nothing being done for AWS. So now we have a bubble for SIG AWS in test grid. And if you actually look at ALB ingress controller, um, there are many other sub-projects. Um, there, there's like basic lint and unit testing available. Um, also, Gyoho from uh, my team is working on enabling an EKS uh, deployer interface that integrates with Prow and Test Infra. That will allow us to actually run more extensive integration testing and advance the feature from alpha to beta. Uh, so going back to the slide, we also have docs. Um, and we've done some blogs in case you want to run through the uh, process yourself of doing a demo. Uh, we have had feature requests from customers whereby they don't want to build one ingress and associate it with one ALB. Essentially, they want one ALB across the entire cluster so that ingresses can be grouped in and they can be multi-homed onto a single ALB. So that's a feature that we are working on, and hopefully we can make that available in beta. Um, the main person to contact on this is Yang. He's sitting right there. He's called Moonfish. He doesn't talk much. Uh, so I have to give him credit. Um, also, Craig from Ticketmaster, who were deeply involved in making this work possible. Um, we're also thinking of actually moving the ingress controller uh, into the 
core uh, out of tree cloud controller manager as when it actually gets into beta. Uh, because we feel that that might be one place where all the cloud provider related code can sit. Um, so yeah, quickly, what does Ingress actually mean? For a person like me, I really want it as dumb as possible. Ingress allows you to enable external HTTP or HTTPS traffic to enter your cluster and actually reach your services. Your services are allowing L4 traffic to reach the backend set of pods, right? And so services install IP tables, and that allows cluster IP to route the traffic back to the backend pods. And so what Ingress actually does is it just acts as an entry point. It's a sort of a, in, a smart router that is routing traffic to multiple endpoints in the back. There are multiple versions available in the market, so we're using AWS ALB when you create any Ingress onto a COPS cluster or an EKS cluster. That's the basic concept. This is another detailed diagram, but basically the ingress controller that we launched runs on the worker nodes. Um, if you see the bottom of the cluster, you can see that the ingress controller essentially is allowed to look at the API server. There is RBAC enabled, and so it can watch as ingresses are created. And the ALB ingress controller, um, or the ALB, which is created whenever an ingress is issued, allows the traffic to enter the service. Um, so as I explained, there are two traffic modes, instance mode and IP mode. Instance mode enables your normal node port, which has a hop, because the ALB can route the traffic to any node, and then the node will use IP tables to find the pod where to route the traffic. For pod IP, CNI just directly moves the traffic to the pod, and there is no hop available there. Um, so quickly, I'll jump into the demo. I recorded it, because I'd be highly stressed doing this live, so please forgive me. Um, but here we are uh, going into the repo that I already cloned. Um, I am running a COPS cluster here. So the cluster is called uh, KubeCon COPS Kubernetes.local. Um, thereafter, I actually create an IAM policy, and this policy allows the nodes on the COPS cluster to talk to the AWS services. So I first create the policy, and then I attach the policy to the nodes. Uh, once I'm done with that, um, I have to then download an RBAC, and that RBAC role is for the ingress controller to be able to talk to the API server. So I associate that RBAC for the ingress controller. Um, there is a YAML for the ALB ingress controller already available. So we download that, and we modify the cluster name in the ingress controller to refer to the um, COPS cluster that we are working with. So we'll quickly do that, and then we will just deploy the ingress controller on the worker nodes. Fairly simple. Hopefully you're not sleeping and with me. Um, so we do a kubectl apply. Awesome, the deployment went through. Um, and now we can check the logs. You'll see that the controller has started, the workers are started, everything looks good. Um, so now, obviously, I have to have a service before I put an ingress in place. So I will first create a namespace, um, and, and I'm going to run a 2048 game. Um, so in that namespace, I am deploying a deployment, and then obviously I'll add a service. So until then, everything is fine. Let's just check everything came up properly, because I have to be extra careful. OK, so the service looks good. Um, and we did it with traffic type node port, not pod IP, uh, just for simplicity. You can change it by using annotations when you're working with it. Um, the deployment is there, and we just check for the namespace, which should be there given the deployment came up. But um, And then now I'll just deploy, now that everything is set up, we'll just deploy the ingress, uh, which again allows HTTP traffic. So that's the 2048 ingress, and I will get the ingress, and happen fast, okay. So that's the endpoint. Oh, okay. And just to prove that I am right and not lying to you, let's just. Oh, I'm not able to open it. Why? Why? Should I try? Yes. Let's see if I can get it to work. Thanks. 
It's my laptop. Yeah, it's your laptop. Oh, no. Did I miss? Oh, because we only have what happened. Damn. Damn. I think we can trust you that it would have worked. Okay, it, it would have worked. If it was on your laptop. We had a little HTCP protection Sorry. with HDMI. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does work, I promise you. So um, hopefully that made sense um, and in terms of how it works and what we do. So just walk through it. The docs are amazing. Um, it'll make sense. Uh, so next is uh, the alpha for the EBS CSI driver that we did. Again, we pegged it to 1.13. Um, and it's uh, compatible with CSI. 0.3 spec, um, and if you are following the release cycle, Saad just did a 1.0 spec release. So hopefully with, the, with our beta uh, version, which comes out in Q1, we will be compatible with the 1.0 spec. Um, so we're actively trying to reach parity with the in-volume provisioner. So the cloud controller manager or the cube controller manager does allow you to directly attach EBS, EFS volumes. Um, our goal with the cloud control, uh, cloud provider team, Walter is sitting right here, and I hope Chris and everyone is here. Uh, our goal is to make sure that we strip out the in-tree uh, volume provisioner and move all the logic of the uh, storage components into CSI so we can isolate it there um, and leave the cloud controller manager to tackle all other cloud controllers um, that are specific to the cloud provider. Uh, so that work is being done um, we have added um, support for different storage class types. Um, there is like the file system type, which includes ext2, ext4, and others. Uh, and others. There are different volume types, types which are very specific to AWS, um, and also encrypted volume and KMS key IDs um, in this particular feature. Uh, this particular feature does not have support for snapshots yet, but by the time we get to beta, we will add support for snapshots. Um, again, uh, because the EKS deployer, which integrates with Prow, is not fully complete, we have to, uh, we haven't done the complete suite of integration testing, but there is still some lint and unit testing that you can see in the CI signal upstream. Um, also, we are working on a project that allows uh, migration of uh, customers who are using entry volume provisioner to CSI seamlessly because we don't want customers to be bothered with the total process of migration. So we're working on certain libraries with Google um, in order to make that happen. And so hopefully by Q3 or so, that work should be done. Cheng is involved in doing most of the work, but uh, we're also working with folks from Red Hat and uh, of course Saad and his team in order to make this happen. Um, quickly, Again, for me, it's very important to understand what it really does. Um, there are two components in the CSI interface. One is the, um, the controller plugin, uh, which is also called CO plugin. It's a gRPC endpoint which serves uh, CSI RPCs, and it can run anywhere. So basically on the master or the worker nodes, it can run in both places. Uh, the node plugin must run on the node, and it actually is responsible for the storage provider's published volume. So it's very simple from that standpoint. Um, and there are RPC calls being implemented between the two. So the main RPCs are identity service, a controller service, and a, a node service. Um, so you can think of identity service as allowing access um, to the other two services. The controller service is basically responsible for creation and deletion of volumes, and the node service allows staging or unstaging of volumes. So that's the basic concept of CSI. Um, this is a generic diagram of how the deployment from AWS's side looks like. We did a headless deployment, and both the plugins are deployed, deployed on the worker nodes. Uh, there are two other modes in which you can deploy it. So if you want more details, you can go to the CSI spec. Uh, but you'll notice here that we have a driver registrar. We have an external provisioner for CSI. We also have an external CSI attacher. And then there is a CSI node. So these are the four components that comes into picture when you're actually working with the CSI um, driver. So again, because... I would be too stressed to do the demo. I had to record it. So we'll run through it. Um, so this is the, uh, I already cloned it. Um, this is the EBS CSI driver. You guys can go and uh, take a look at it. 
uh, again, I'm running a COPS cluster. It's called CSI now. Um, all the pods are up, and there are certain flags that need to be modified in the Kube API server and the kubelet. So those flags are you have to allow privileged equal to true, and you also have to provide feature gates for CSI node and CSI driver registry to be true. Once that's done in both Kube API server and kubelet, then you can actually run CSI effectively. Uh, so after that is done, please believe me that the kubelet was done, because it would be too much to log into the machine and show you. So um, after that is done, uh, we have to deploy a CRD, and that's how the CSI info is recognized and distributed across the cluster. So this is how the CRD looks like. It's called CSI node info. Um, you can do a kubectl get CRD to verify that. So the CRD is running, the flags are changed, and um, I'll show you that if you go into the repository, there is a section under deploy Kubernetes where we have multiple versions of manifests that you could use in order to play with the CSI driver. Uh, so I'm trying version 1.12. There is a secret um, here. So the secret is in the format of um, essentially your key ID and access key ID, which is identity in any EC2 uh, node. Obviously, in the future, we will do something um, more interesting, like adding a pod identity or a cube to IM way of adding these features instead of manually typing it into the file. Uh, but for now, I'm copying the secret. I will apply the secret, and then uh, we will deploy the CSI attacher, the CSI provisioner, and the CSI nodes. Um, so now that I've applied the secret, you'll see that um, the RBAC for each of those components have been applied. There's a service account created and a daemon set that's running. Again, this allows each of those components to talk to the API server and to actually register when um, volumes are being created onto the cluster. After that, there is a sample app, and the sample app essentially has a storage class with uh, the CSI driver. It also has a persistent volume and a claim, and uh, we will slowly see that if you do a kubectl get for the PV, you can get you can see that the PVC is attached to claim one, and the claim one is bound. Um, essentially, I'll just do a cat on the pod YAML, just so you know that's actually called claim one. Um, so you can see that the claim one is uh, the claim name is claim one, um, and the pod is called app. So we can look at, quickly look at the storage class. Previously, the storage class would have been a direct EBS reference. Now it's a provisional called ebs.csi.aws. Um, so what you do is then just deploy, um, see if you can find the uh, app. So if the app came up properly, then you should be able to see app is properly deployed and it's running. So hopefully that makes sense. I ran through it very quickly, but the components are exactly the same. Uh, going back to the third uh, project that we worked on, uh, this is the external cloud provider, AWS. I was just referring to it. We did an alpha for it. Um, we are working with Google to make sure, Google and DigitalOcean and all our friends in OpenStack to make sure that a bunch of interfaces and dependencies for the cloud provider uh, code is being moved into staging uh, so that we can cleanly cut out the cloud provider controller manager from core Kubernetes. But in the meantime, we've also done testing for the uh, cloud controller binary per se. Uh, for this to work, you have to change certain flags, obviously. This will run in the master. Um, it can run as a daemon set or it can run as pretty much any sort of uh, uh, API object that Kubernetes has. You just have to make sure the leader election is properly taken care of. Um, the Kube API server and Kube controller manager as a 1.13 does not, will not run the cloud provider flag when you run the out of tree cloud controller manager. But for the kubelet, you'll have to call cloud provider equal to external. So once you enable those feature flags in each of the manifest, all you have to do is run the cloud controller manager binary, which will be available as a image, um, as a daemon set or whatever other object in Kubernetes that you want to run it as. 
Um, again, this is alpha. It's not yet completely stabilized, so we're still working on some of the docs and um, you know some of the Docker files and modifying and updating stuff. But you should uh, take a look at it towards end of the week and give us some feedback. Uh, Mike is more is very quite involved in this work, um, but also uh, other folks like Gyoho and Yang will be involved because we will be adding new controllers into it. And of course, Justin does all our reviews, which is awesome. Um, so this is the AWS Kubernetes tester, as I said, for proud to integrate with EKS. We added this deployer interface into Test Infra. We worked with uh, Ben Elder and Sen Lu from Google, and it was uh, we had a great time trying to add this over. And today our test coverage is around three percent, but hopefully going forward we will expand that to more. Um, and that will help us provide better CI signal to all the projects that we are working on. With that, I'll hand it over to Justin. Thank you, Nishi. I think that's that's a great update. I, uh, you've really laid down the gauntlet there. I, I'm thinking back to all the sort of previous SIG updates I've given, where I have sort of probably glossed over a lot of these things. So, yes, I will. I will aspire to that level of. Oops, where'd we go? Sorry, I will aspire to that level of, of depth in future. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to cover some of the last couple of projects we have going. Uh, the first one is the AWS encryption provider. Um, this is a subproject been, been around for a while. It's going alpha in or went alpha in Kubernetes 110. It, requires SD3 and a bunch of other things, including most notably API server changes. So this is something that uh, probably you have to get baked into your upstream tool, whether it's COPS or EKS or any other tool you're using. Um, the, the, I do have a demo on this one. The attack it's sort of preventing, or the problem it's solving, is that in the past, or up until now, uh, the data in etcd has not been encrypted. Uh, the volumes underlying it can be encrypted, but uh, let's see if I do, a, I think I have a config map here, for example. And I should have, which is called example. <laughs> and if I were to get that value from etcd, that was a lucky autocomplete, and dump it out, uh, you should see, nope, that's the wrong one. Never mind that, don't pay it no attention. <laughs> that's, don't name them both the same. There we go, all right. You can see that the actual, uh, values there are, at the end, they're in text. Uh, tip config maps are not, not for secrets. And if I were to do kubectl, kubectl get config map example of YAML, you can see that is actually the, pretty much a one-to-one -one representation. It's encoding using, using protobuf, but they are not encrypted in any way. Um, and so what the AWS, AWS encryption provider does is it uses uh, the KMS service of, of AWS. And uh, KMS is a sort of secure store of encryption keys and is effectively a uh, key management and encryption service as a service. <laughs> uh, and if we look at what a secret looks like in this world, so although through the API server, if you've got to get secrets, through the API server, you're able to see the rule values as you always were before. They are base64 encoded, again, really not encrypted. Uh, if we were to look at that in etcd, you can see that they are encrypted. There is here a header which says this is an encrypted value using the AWS KMS provider. And then there's a whole bunch of junk, which is not just base64 encoded. This is actually genuine encrypted. And so the idea is that if you were to gain access to etcd in some way as an attacker, that does not give you access to everything in the system. Uh, you can configure which API objects you want to be encrypted or not encrypted. And at the moment, it, I believe just secrets are encrypted. If you were more paranoid, you can encrypt everything. But that's a very quick demo of that project. Uh, I don't think Seth is here, but Seth Pollock is the person that wrote that uh, project and has been doing some great work on that. Um, yeah. Uh, this uh, should give us a bit of, bit of background here. This was a, 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 something that was originally built I think for GCE KMS, and was originally built into the Kubernetes API server. And then it was extracted and made, there was a real interface created, and the GCE implementation was kicked out of tree, and it now runs as a separate pod. And the, that means that any cloud provider or, in theory, a bare metal provider can also plug into that same interface and implement it. And so this is something we're seeing again and again with all these projects. Like we're able to develop outside of Kubernetes, Kubernetes in the Kubernetes SIGs repo. We have good management around that now and, and great testing, thanks to the work you've been doing. Thank you. And yeah, that's the encryption provider. The next project is the AWS IAM Authenticator, which uh, 
I can't remember who originally started this. I guess Matt Landis, but yeah. Um, no. Anyway. Matt Morris and Heptio. Thank you. That's it. Um, they Heptio originally started this. This allows use of I of AWS uh, credentials to authenticate to the Kubernetes API server, uh, which is a really nice integration. What? Yes. Yeah, so this is that is AWS IAM Authenticator. It's it's available um, and it. Uh, it is, it is very handy both for end users and for, I think, like you'd use it for uh, uh, EC, like if you had an EC2 instance, you could also use it for authentication there. Um, good progress on that as well. And the cluster API AWS implement. Chuck is here, I like you. Uh, so Chuck has been doing great work on that. Um, this is essentially the, the cluster, uh, a subproject of SIG cluster lifecycle is uh, producing uh, an API called the cluster API, whose big uh, addition is the machines API, which gives programmatic access to infrastructure in a way that we haven't really had before, specifically to spin up machines through the Kubernetes API. Uh, there's potential to integrate with, for example, the autoscaler is sort of the, the most obvious, uh, like, killer use case. So we, we have a autoscaler, uh, Kubernetes autoscaler integration with uh, AWS autoscaling groups today, but it's a little bit flaky. It sort of uses, it's a little bit fragile. It uses tags. Um, and this is a, we make the, we, we essentially surface uh, EC2 instances in the case of AWS as first class instances in Kubernetes. And on top of that, we build objects called machine sets and machine deployments, which are similar to uh, deployments and replica sets for pods. So we essentially treat machines as uh, first-class objects in Kubernetes, and we're able to, with providers through this well-known interface, which Chuck has been doing great work on, thank you, uh, we're able to you know, create uh, different uh, your launch instances using different AMIs and configure the control plane, I guess the control plane, but, and uh, the nodes using kubeADM. And um, yeah, it's, it's great. And it's, if, if you're looking for a project to get involved in, I would definitely encourage that one is a great one to get involved in. For me, that's the most exciting. Personally, I find it the most exciting project in Kubernetes right now. Um, so that is a great one, and I encourage you to take a look at that. But it is, it is only alpha at the moment in terms of usage. I wouldn't run your prod clusters on it just yet. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah OK, there we go. But please do try it out. Uh, EKS Cuddle, do you want to talk about this one? Or? Yeah. Um... Or should I? This one is not an existing subproject, but it allows us to create uh, EKS clusters with great ease. Um, there has been a discussion about making it a subproject. It's still up in the airs, um, and we have to go through a formal review with the steering committee. But we did want to talk about it because it's uh, effort put in by WeWorks and also um, Elia. We call him Error Developer. Um, and that's why I just wanted to give a status update, but obviously this will be up for debate within the SIG, and then uh, we'll probably ask the steering committee um, if they can approve the project. Yeah, I think, I think our SIG, when we talked about it in the meeting, our SIG is generally, by way of background, our SIG is generally supportive of the idea. I think it's an unusual one in that it's only usable with a commercial offering. Yeah. And so the question is, does that, where does that fit in the in the universe of, yeah. of projects. Uh, but EKS Cuddle, yeah, great tool. I suppose that's just etcd status. Yes. Um, I wanted to call out Geho, uh, who's been doing great work with us, uh, especially in the CI signal integration. I can see um, Aaron sitting there. He's been beating us up to make sure we have better CI signal. Uh, so we have done some work with him on the EKS tester. Um, but apart from that, obviously, etcd got donated, and we did a future blog with uh, Google on the roadmap that we'll maintain for etcd. So I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Gyoho for his great work. Yeah, and I'm excited by some of the other things coming. Like I think the non-voting members will really make it much easier to manage etcd, but it's perhaps a different SIG. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yes. And so I, I, I I don't know if there's anything you want to call out on this slide. I think I would call out on this slide just that there is a lot happening in the SIG. It obviously is a lot to keep track of, but there's a plan to get a lot of stuff into, into alpha and beta, or through, past alpha to beta and GA, help people move their existing clusters that, or their existing volumes, I guess, to 
the, the future world of CSI. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think some of these dates are perhaps a little tentative or aggressive, maybe. Uh, but uh, there is a lot happening on many paths. But Nishi has been doing a great job of imposing more order on the SIG. And so hopefully you're able to, you'll be able to better track that through CAPS and those sort of efforts. Yeah, and I did want to call out that a lot of people have been talking about NLB not being uh, betaed, um, and people are concerned about that. Um, but we will get NLB to a beta stage by Q1, um, and then move it forward uh, into a GA state. But other than that, the existing subprojects will be moved from alpha to beta to GA, and of course we will just try to improve the testing coverage on it. So that's a summary of uh, everything that we had to talk today. That's, that's it. I don't, should we open for, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Wow, that was fast. I, we have mics because I don't know if it's easier to do the mics or to repeat it, but I will run down to you with a mic if you would like. <laughs> Try to run. That's a good thought. Um, one of the core issues in running GCP, GRCP on AWS is that the ALB supports HTTP2 up to the actual ALB, but basically negates it or drops it back to 1.1. Does the ALB ingest support HTTP2 all the way back to the pod? There we go. We have a, yeah. an answer cool. from Fantastic. the audience as well. That is, that is a lifesaver. <laughs> it is GRPC support. Currently, the LB terminates the uh, HTTP traffic at the LB endpoint, so the backend doesn't receive HTTP2 traffic. So I think we will support it once LB is self-supported, but we need yeah. to discuss with the LBT. So basically, all the limitations of the LB is still present in the ingest? Correct. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. OK. You and then I'll come to you if that's OK. Oh, hi. So where does Route 53 fit in all of this? Like, Obviously, we've still got the DNS controller and COPS. It feels like it needs to be pulled into it, certainly with the ingress controllers that you're building. I mean, I can, I can talk to that. We have the external DNS project, which is, uh, well, just in case, uh, which is going to, uh, which is intended to, uh, the, a bunch of, there were a bunch of DNS controllers that sort of came together into the external DNS uh, project, and COPS has its DNS controller still in COPS tree, and we need to get it out of COPS land and start adopting external DNS, but external DNS is configuration of DNS outside the cluster, which is why it's called external DNS. Um, and it includes Route 53, but also any, uh, I think it has a, a, probably about a dozen providers it supports. It supports Google Cloud DNS, it supports Cloudflare, uh, I think it supports GoDaddy, and like these sort of, like a bunch of different things. Um, but that's sort of the, the path for it, and it doesn't necessarily need particularly tight integration with the ingress controller, because it's able to observe ingress objects, and I think service objects, and I think there's support for observing direct DNS record specifications as well. So I, I don't think it, the design of Kubernetes, I think, I think, allows it not to be tightly integrated. And COPS in particular needs to get onto using it. But if you wanted to configure DNS records, I think external DNS is in a, is in a good state to, to do that today. OK, so it's good support just to say separate at this point and do that. Yes. Yeah. You want to come with you? Let me run this way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not entirely sure this is the right venue for this question, but um, is there any concern or information about uh, COPS sort of lagging behind mainline in terms of the versions that it supports and deploys? That is a question for you, Justin. Yes. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so COPS has not yet released 1.11. Uh, we will do so shortly. There is one more PR we want to land in. Uh, we want to land upstream. COPS does not do our own cherry picks, as it were. Um, so we sort of are waiting on that. Our, that. That particular bug is actually fixed in 112. So we will do that. The, the feedback we've got from COPS users, I don't, I don't want to spend too much, but yeah, the feedback we've got from, this is supposed to be Cigatus, but I don't want to give, the feedback we've got from COPS users is that, we, that COPS users like that the .0 release actually is basically prod ready and doesn't go out with known issues. Uh, the way we are going to, square the circle, as it were, is I have promised to do alpha releases of 112 and 113, and I think 114 imminently. So you will have the option to run, should you decide that you, in fact, are ready to run 111 or 112 or 113 or 114, that you could do so. 
you're not gated on us doing so. And then when COPS.0 lands, that is sort of the indicator that we believe it to be more ready. OK, so it's something that's coming in a format that we can run it for ourselves, but a matter of when is sort of fuzzy. Well, I mean, so you will be able to run the, dot, the, the alphas whenever you want, and then the dot zero will be an indication that we as a project, we as a COPS project, believe it to be not just the Kubernetes, but the ecosystem of things that we manage to be, to be ready. OK, great. Thank you. By the way, all the demos that I did was on COPS using version 1.12. Um, so unless we have, I think you guys should test and maybe throw more issues out and see if what goes wrong with 1.12. And once the alpha release comes out, we'll probably have a more, more stability around the COPS tool. So this is going to be a slightly different question. Um, I was one of the steering committee members who reviewed the SIG AWS charter, and I wanted to commend SIG AWS for putting language in the charter to specifically make diversity and inclusion one of their top priorities. Uh, and I just wanted to call that out in the context of this room. I can't see the front of the room, but I'm looking around in the back, and I count maybe two people who are not white dudes. Um, and I'm curious, like, what specific things you're thinking you might do to help improve diversity and inclusion. I'm a big fan of whatever we can do to make this place seem like a more welcoming community. And I'm just struck by the makeup of the room right now. Um, so first of all, you have me and you have Chris Nova, which makes it better. And then Justin has to tolerate us, which is always awesome. Um, so the other thing that I will give credit to Bob, but he um, did uh, give me the privilege of working with two ADA interns. Uh, one of them is here, Kirsten. Um, and Karina is not here, but uh, they've been involved with EKS Cuttle. And I've also stressed them through working on COPS. And um, also, they've been building tools for us to better track AWS issues as they pile up. So we can resolve these issues and provide some form of SLA to the community upstream. Um, also, one of the other interns, Karina, has helped me um, actually measure the contributions, which were really bad before, and now they're averaging at 120, per, 120 commits per month, which is quite decent, um, given where we are at. So we've at least started by having ADA interns. Both of them converted their full-time full roles at AWS. Um, there are more interns in Eshwar's team. He's right there. He runs the EKS service team. Um, I mean, we're doing what we can for diversity. Um, I'm sure Amazon is interested in improving that. Um, but as of now, I mean, we're all involved in the mentoring sessions as well, baby steps. Um, and maybe I will help Paris out, because she's overwhelmed and she needs help in more mentoring. And that might be the way to move things forward. Thank you. And I wanted to give a, a shout out as well to, to Nishi for actually doing that cap, which uh, I had certainly been, not the, yes, sorry, the charter, which I'd been sitting on for a while and not, not actually making progress on. And, but yes, obviously, I need to make more efforts in that department as well. There's one over here, I think, earlier. Was there or did it? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Looks different perspective from. <laughs> so it's sort of related to the same COPS question on terms of lag between what's available. So it's 110 now. My TAM just told me 111 by the end of the month for EKS. So how does your stuff feed into that release schedule? By the time, because 110 is already end of life. If I get 111, oh, 110 is, so 110 is not end of life. Well, end it's of support. the last support. It's the oldest yeah, supported, supported release right now. Yeah, right. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't know if. Are you feeding into that? So when can we expect one? To, are we always going to be two revs behind on AWS? Uh, well, I mean, so EKS and COPS are separate tools, and we have separate release cycles, and the EKS. Manager's right there, so. <laughs> Manager? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 111 is very imminent. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so the reason why we, we, like, we went out at 110 when we went GA, uh, it's taken us four months to get to 111, right? So the reason why we delayed 111 is so that we can actually get, get it alongside with the upgrades, the ability to upgrade the clusters from 110 to 111, right? So that's the reason, right? So as we move forward, you'll see us releasing it at a, at a much brisker brisk pace because, uh, because now that we have upgrades, right? So 
So we're planning on one, one 12, two months, which is an improvement from four months, right? So, uh, and then our goal next year is to be, is to be, uh, is to make new versions available in EKS within one month of the community release, right? So, so that's our aspiration. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And we need help with COPS versions. So if you want to well, help, you're welcome. Yeah, the, I mean, in COPS, we're gonna we're gonna push to make releases more automated and have the alphas as being basically available and it's sort of on your own head if you want to try it. But you have the at least you will have the option to try it. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add some some color to that a little bit. Uh, one of AWS's main competitors and one of the founders of uh, Kubernetes didn't actually roll 111 out in their hosted offering until like a month ago, right? Um, it feels an awful lot like the downstream providers of Kubernetes offerings are taking a while to actually keep up with the upstream because their experience in actually rolling this out doesn't seem to be all that fantastic. And as somebody who watches the upstream dashboards that describe how do we automatically upgrade from an older version of Kubernetes to a newer version of Kubernetes and see those be perpetually read, I am not surprised that providers are having a difficult time making it really easy to upgrade Kubernetes. I suspect that if you would be willing to contribute resources, be that other people or time or money or uh, descriptions of how you are upgrading and what you are using to upgrade, we collectively as a community could probably overwhelm the efforts of any single cloud provider or downstream provider to make upgrades kind of a solved story. I feel like the SIG cluster lifecycle SIG is maybe one of the places that's trying to do this uh, via Kube ADM. But I'm also kind of looking for a canonical open source story for launching a Kubernetes cluster and upgrading it that is uh, staffed and well maintained by community members. The problem is today on um, on the majority of the CI we run for the project, that is a, a couple thousand lines of bash that the community as a whole kind of refuses to maintain. And it falls on a few select individuals in the company that I and Justin work in. Uh, there's also so COPS, but again, I don't feel like there's been a phenomenal level of support behind COPS. Uh, so I'm really interested to see what happens with the cluster API project because that seems to be where we are trying to once again redefine the concept of a, a cluster description that would be portable across providers and providers that are kind of completely open source as well to stand those clusters up. And I think that would be the appropriate place for the community to help uh, make it easier for them to get uh, releases that are well tested and available sooner. So hopefully that provides some color. And I have a talk tomorrow about how we're suggesting to use operators for add-ons, which is sort of part of that story of having an approach which could be used across multiple providers. I'll be running them up to Bob. Hi, I'm way in the back of the room. Uh, I wanted to add to something Aaron said and just a bit of perspective in terms of where it would be good to put more effort. Um, this came up at the... Uh, small but intense etcd panel uh, that we had uh, this week and i think that you know, when you're when you're doing an upgrade probably the like one of the riskiest parts of doing an upgrade is actually the etcd part of the upgrade and right now it's kind of this all or nothing thing where you tend to upgrade everything in one go and being able to have a matrix of testing between different versions of etcd and different versions of the control plane bits is probably one of the areas we need to do a lot better in so that we're able to not have upgrades be this big bang thing. And um, of course, we're working a lot in the etcd community. I, I guess I guess Gyoho's not here, but um, he's certainly our, our leader in that spot. So anyway, I, I'd just say as a place to work, that's probably one of the ones. I don't know if you agree with that, Aaron, or not, but yeah, all right. Great, thank you. So, so I reckon Aaron was not. Bob is a six scale chair, as well as the GM for uh, Amazon EKS. So. There were some more questions? Yeah. yeah. Who else? I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, so since we're already uh, all over the COPS topic here. OK. <laughs> other projects will often tag uh, low-hanging fruit for issues for new contributors coming in. What's the best way as a new contributor that I can help with COPS so that we can start getting releases coming out faster? Uh, yes. Oh, uh, the, are, <laughs> we should, that was loaded, the, obviously. I don't know if the, the, those were your two questions, but they do feel like two questions. I think that one of them was, how do I get involved as a new contributor, which I need to do better on identifying what issues those are. 
And then there was how can I help get releases out faster, which is not a new contributor issue. That is actually mostly just uh, automating the build scripts and dealing with infrastructure type things, which is probably a frustrating place to start. So I would not recommend that unless you really want to. If you want to, then we should talk about it afterwards. But really use the help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, I, uh, I think in, across all the projects, we should do a better job of tagging issues that are genu genuinely good for starter, help wanted. They do tend to rot. So if it, it, I am bad at removing the label, I have, I have seen issues where I have not removed the label until someone has tried, and it is not an easy issue. And that is sort of why it lingers for like three months. So it is a great idea to comment first, to say, I am interested in doing this, and here is how I am proposing to do it, and then I can really maybe dig in and really think about it, because sometimes those labels are misapplied. So we need to do a better job of applying them to more places. Um, so I have a, we've started doing something around this, and I, according to exactly what you're saying, but I stole the idea from Andrew Kim, say cloud provider. They do a very good job of tagging um, every issue as a feature or a bug, and then they also tag it as easy, medium, or difficult. Uh, so we're beginning to do that with all the issues that we are collecting through Kirsten's tool. So you should participate in SIG AWS because I'll start reporting on all that and then you know we can get to a better place just like Justin mentioned and maybe you can start with the easy issues and see if it, that works for you and then graduate up to we're helping with Cluster API. Thank you. So I think there was one down, down your row actually. Yeah. <laughs> but we, can, we should talk later and yeah, I hope I can find some. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, are there any plans to bring the AWS VPC CNI into the SIG? And second question, are there any plans for a SIG blessed um, workload, identity, thing, something like kube 2 im or KIM? Yes, yeah, so um, if I may. Pod identity is a proposal from Micah. He will be presenting a, a cap very soon. And that proposal is out there. We just need a cap and a formal review on it. Um, he can talk more about it, or you can talk to him about it. It's Yeah, go ahead, Micah, if you want to. Uh, we've been told that we're 10 minutes over time. So oh, maybe okay. we should break out into a separate <laughs> thing. Yeah. yeah, just come talk to me afterwards. Yeah, talk to Micah, please. Yeah. yeah, and the CNI will not be a subproject yet. It'll stay where it is, but uh, that's how it stands. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You.